So we recently are hearing a lot about a guy named Leopold Aschenbrenner, who's a former super alignment researcher at OpenAI. He was making waves in the AI community with a series of pretty thought-provoking essays and interviews on the rapid approach of AGI and possibly eventually super intelligence. Ashenbrenner is also notable because he was fired in April from OpenAI for allegedly leaking confidential information. This is an allegation he's kind of contextualized on popular podcasts like the Dwar Kesh podcast, which we both love. Basically saying he simply shared an AI safety document that he was working on with some outside researchers after, you know, making sure there was no sensitive info in it. We can, you know, talk about that piece. But really, what's getting everyone's attention is this very extensive thesis that he's laid out both in interviews and in a series of related essays that are about 150 pages long or so called Situational Awareness, The Decade Ahead. And basically in them, he claims that he's one of perhaps right now a few hundred AI insiders who are seeing signals that say we are going to have super intelligence, quote, in the true sense of the word, by the end of the decade, and that AGI by 2027 is, quote, strikingly plausible. He then goes on to lay out very extensive arguments over why that is the case. Furthermore, he also makes kind of a big argument here that this fact happening is going to kick off some serious competition between the United States and China in a national security race to basically build and control AGI. And it's a race that he says, if we screw it up, could lead to all out war. So, you know, that's fun. But basically, he's arguing that, look, I'm seeing a bunch of talk in San Francisco shift from $10 billion compute clusters to $100 billion clusters to trillion dollar clusters. So basically, there's this infrastructure kind of arms race kicking off. And he says the AGI race has begun. We are building machines that can think and reason. By 2025, 26, these machines will outpace many college graduates. By the end of the decade, they will be smarter than you or I. Before long, the world will wake up. But right now, there are perhaps a few hundred people, most of them in San Francisco and the AI labs that have situational awareness. So, Paul, there's a ton to unpack here. I'm personally only about halfway through the full set of essays. They seem really, really good. But let's kind of take this one step at a time. First, maybe walk us through your thoughts on Leo Ashenbrenner and just like his overall thesis, like how seriously should we be taking him and his perspective? So I, I think, you know, anybody who's listened to this podcast for a long time or even just last tap out at 10 episodes knows we try and take a very balanced approach to all of this. We try and listen to the EAC people and, you know, the techno optimist crowd that's accelerated at all costs. We try and share their perspectives. We share the perspectives of the doomers, um, you know, the people who have a high P doom, as they would call it, the probability of doom that, you know, this is all going to go really sideways. And then Mike and I generally kind of fall in the realist realm. We try and accept that there's different perspectives and we try and uncover, you know, the, the directional truth within those perspectives. And we try and figure out what might actually happen. And so. I definitely try not to get caught up, but I, I also listen. So I listened to the whole Thor question, which I think was almost like three hours long. Yeah. Um, I was familiar with Leopold. I was actually following him on Twitter, but I, I didn't know deeply, you know, his background that he was a valedictorian of Columbia at age 19, you know, started college at 15. Um, he's obviously a genius. Um, and, and so I think that's, uh, his intelligence matters here. Like, this is someone who has a proven history of being able to analyze things very deeply, learn topics very quickly. He's been on the inside at the super intelligence team. The situational awareness document you mentioned is dedicated to Ilya Sutskova, who hmm. we've talked about many times. Ilya was uh, Leopold's boss. Probably I would imagine on the super alignment team is probably who he reported to, um, the whole thing is based on this premise of scaling laws that we have talked about on the show many times, that there are a lot of leading AI researchers who currently see uh, a continued predictable trend in the computing power that we, you know, give it more chips, 
that these algorithms used to do the computation are becoming more efficient. They're able to get more out of these chips because they find efficiencies through algorithmic gains. And then what he turns on hobbling is there's these things that are sort of in the way of progress, but there aren't any things that they don't think they can solve. So basically there's a bunch of like dumb things that kind of get in the way or prevent the, the progress from happening but they think that they're largely able to get through a lot of these things through either reinforcement learning through human feedback, giving it chain of thought reasoning, uh, giving it tools, or just kind of like improving the algorithms. And so the whole premise of this is we are following these scaling laws. And if we follow these, then there's these predictable leaps that will be made from GPT-2 to GPT-3 to 4 to 5 to 6. And they being, you know, these few hundred people who are at the forefront of this don't see any signs that this won't hold true. And so if you go back to episode 87, this was what I was talking about. Like, this is exactly the theory. So I, I mean, I've been reading this with great interest because it aligns with a lot of the timeline stuff we were talking about, and it sort of goes much deeper in a lot of key areas, um, that I've been sort of waiting for people to start talking more about. So I was pretty excited when I saw this. So what I'm going to do is I'll just recap the couple of sections. It is dense. Like, as you <laughs> said, Mike, like it's, it's long. I would give this to Gemini and like have a conversation yeah. with Google Gemini about it probably. Um, okay. So the, the first chapter is, um, from GPT to AGI counting the ooms and oom means order of magnitude. Uh, 10x improvement equals one order of magnitude. So it's just kind of like some technical terminology, but ooms is a critical concept here because he basically goes through and says, hey, to go from this to, you know, three ooms of compute is a $100 billion cluster. And we already know that Microsoft and OpenAI are rumored to be working on that. And that seems plausible. Now, the the big stuff, like the, the super intelligence starts bumping into limitations of infrastructure and energy, which we talked about as the limitation on episode 87. Um, but so that's the, the first section is AGI by 2027 is strikingly plausible. GPT-2 to GPT-4 took us from preschooler to smart uh, high schooler abilities. Tracing these trend lines, we should go from preschool to high schooler size qualitative jump by 2027. The second section was um, from AGI to super intelligence, the intelligence explosion. AI progress won't stop at human level. Hundreds of millions of AGIs could automate AI research compressing a decade of algorithmic progress, five plus ooms, uh, into one year, we would rapidly go from human level to vastly superhuman AI systems. The power and peril of superintelligence would be dramatic. The third section is racing to the trillion dollar cluster. The most extraordinary techno capital, capital acceleration has been set in motion. As AI revenue grows rapidly, many trillions of dollars will go into GPU data center and power build out before the end of the decade, the industrial mobilization, including growing U.S. electricity production by tens of percent will be intense. The third, and this gets into the thing you talked about, China, the nations uh, that locked down the lab, securing uh, security for AGI. This was a big part of his focus on the mm -hmm. Dwarkesh podcast. The nation's leading AI labs treat security as an afterthought. It was terrifying to hear him talk about what's happening in these labs. And then ironically, 24 hours after this podcast dropped, OpenAI drops a blog post talking about how they're handling security. So hit a nerve for sure. Um, and they were trying to kind of like fight back from a PR perspective against some of it, but I don't think they have much ground to stand on. I think what he's saying is probably true. Um, it says currently they're basically hand, handing the key secrets for AGI to uh, CCP on a silver platter, securing the AGI secrets and weights against state actor threat will be an immense effort and we're not on track. The, the next section was super alignment, which they dissolved that team that he was on with Ilya. Reliably controlling AI systems much smarter than we are is an unsolved technical problem. And while it is a solvable problem, things could very easily go off the rails during a rapid intelligence explosion. Managing this will be extremely tense. Failure could be uh, easily catastrophic. The, the next, the free world must prevail. Super intelligence will give a decisive economic and military advantage. Um, in the race to AGI, the free world's very survival will be at stake. Again, this is where some people are like, ah, it's a little much. And it may be, but he's got some really good data. Hmm. Um, and then the project, I, I specifically like this one because this is my, I'm not like saying this is the hill I'm going to die on yet, but this is kind of the direction I'm, I'm going. I'll explain the context here. 
as the race to AGI intensifies, the national security state will get involved. Um, U.S. government will wake from its slumber, and by 27, 28, we'll get some form of government AGI project. No startup can handle super intelligence somewhere in a skiff. Um, secure, what does that stand for? Secure. Yeah, it's like, facility. I forget what the acronym is, but it's where they securely brief people Correct. with intelligence briefings. Like you cannot like have devices in there and stuff. Forget what it, I'll have to look up what it is. Yeah, you can look up while I'm rambling here. So the, the end game. Of it. So here's my feeling. I don't believe that the current administration, nor the former administration in the United States, nor based on the current candidates either administration that will come has the will and the vision to do what is likely needed. And that is a Apollo level and beyond project to build and control the infrastructure necessary for the intelligence explosion. So the United States government, and again, I know we have listeners all around the world and you know, other governments should be doing something similar, but in the United States in the 1960s, when we said we're going to put a, put humans on the moon, it was a decade long initiative that at its peak was 6% of the entire, entire federal budget was going to the Apollo program to build the rockets that would put us on the moon. We need that. Like there needs to be an, an effort made by the government. Now, 6% wouldn't be enough. The, based on my research this morning, the budget in the United States is 1.7 trillion. The actual annual outlay, the spending is 6.5 trillion. 6% isn't sufficient. You, you can't be spending a couple hundred billion. So in the, the Apollo program was 25 billion over a decade, which is the equivalent of about 250 billion in today's dollars. That's not going to cut it. We, we need trillions. So if I was the U S government, I would be aggressively putting a plan in place to spend trillions of dollars over the next five to 10 years to house all the infrastructure in the United States, to keep all the best companies, the chip builders, the intelligence builders in the United States, because it is an imperative for the security of the country and for the economic viability in the future. So, um, that, that, like, I think if anything, I'm sure there's people in Congress reading this, I'm sure yeah. they're being briefed as we speak. If the U S government doesn't take a massive initiative, um, I think they're, there's, they're going to regret it in within three to five years, a massive regret because there's no. OpenAI can build whatever they're going to build. NVIDIA can build whatever they're going to build unless we build the infrastructure to allow it to prosper and we do it in, in the United States. Like it, it's just not going to happen. They're going to run up against energy issues. They're going to run up against like electricity issues. They're going to run up against, you know, where the data center is going to go. And the $10 billion chips act the U S did was nice start, but 10 billion in, isn't doing it. That's, that's not going to cut. I mean, Anthropics raised 7 billion on their own already. So. That was like one of the things. And then I'll just end with the kind of the, the synopsis he gives at the end, I thought was pretty solid. So he says, what if we're right? And this is the big question for me. Is, is there like a 30% chance he's right? That that's good enough for me. Like 30% solid. Um, we should probably be really aggressively uh, assessing this possibility if we're in even 10%. Um, and I think it's higher than that. I, I think that the direction he's saying this goes there's probably at least a 50, 50 chance that he's, he's right. Um, that would get, that should get action. So he says, what if we're right before the decade is out, we will have super intelligence. This is what most of the series is about. Um, you mentioned there's like a few people in, in, you know, basically in San Francisco who have this situational awareness that are aware of this. Um, it's hard to contemplate. People think deep learning is going to hit this wall, but they don't. But then he takes on like, hey, the doomers, they're obsessed with uh, AGI for years, give them a lot of credit for their prescience. But um, basically, they're, they're not thinking about this the right way. These claims of doom and calls for indefinite pause are clearly not the way. Like, we can't just stop. And then he says, on the other end, we have the EX, and they're narrowly focused on like some good points and progress must, conti must continue. But, and I love this, beyond, beneath their shallow Twitter shit posting, they are a sham. And he just kind of straight up says like, this is all for them to just build, um, their own products around it and chatbots and basically make some money, you know, capitalistic approach to this. We're just going to make some money off of this thing. So he, he says the core tenants are super intelligence is a matter of national security, which I agree with hundred percent. America must lead. If you're in America, you're going to agree with that. I would say democratic societies much must lead, you know, NATO must lead. Like, I think that that that's more of the approach here is we need an international effort 
to have democratic values and democratic governments that, that do this, that would probably be a better outcome for society. And then like, we need to not screw it up. So he says the, if we're right, these are the people that have invented and built it. They think AGI will be developed this decade. And though there's a fairly wide spectrum, many of them take very seriously the possibility that the road to super intelligence will play out as I've described in this series on the dark dark cash podcast. They talk about these like private parties where all the researchers from DeepMind mm-hmm. and OpenAI and Anthropic all hang out together and compare notes. And they're all kind of on the same page here of where this goes. So he says, like, I could get some of this wrong, but realistically, like, this is kind of what we think is going to happen. And so then he said, as you mentioned, right now, there are perhaps a few hundred people in the world who realize what's about to hit us, who understand just how crazy things are about to get, who have situational awareness. I probably either personally know or am one degree of separation from everyone who could plausibly run the project, which is the, the big Apollo type mission I mentioned. The few folks behind the scenes who are desperately trying to keep things from falling apart are you and your buddies and their buddies. That's it. That's all there is. Someday it will be out of our hands, but right now, at least for the next few years of mid-game, the fate of the world rests on these people. Oh, yeah, man. That, it was that's like, a quote. <laughs> yeah, like, I I mean, I was, when I was listening to their question podcast, I was like, holy shit. And, and then... Mm. I, you know, I was reading the report and I'm like, man, like there's a lot to process here. And I, I honestly don't disagree with any of it. Like there was nothing in there. I was like, oh, okay, this is an exaggeration. I was like, no, he's following scaling laws. And if these stay true, everything he's saying is plausible. Like there's nothing in this that isn't a leap, um, to think it's, it's doable. And then it gets into the thing we've always said with the AI timeline episode 87. I was like, we have to figure out what does this mean? And I think this is kind of reinforcing that it's like, Hey, we're further laying out the possibility here. What does it mean to government? What does it mean to business? What does it mean to society? What does it mean to educational systems? What does it mean to human purpose? Like it's, yeah, it's, it, it's important. Like it's, I know this is a lot and it's kind of overwhelming. Um, but we all have to really start like thinking about these things. We're talking about a few years. <laughs> like, mm. I mean, if you're, if you have a kid who's a freshman in high school, by the time they graduate, they're saying this is this is where it might be by the time they go to college. That's how fast this is going to happen. Fun, fun fact of how small you know that community is. Who, a person we talked about, uh, I believe last week, Avital Balwit, who was writing the "My Last Five Years of Work" essay, uh, also advised on this writing among many other people. So a lot of people were tweeting this saying this is important. You, yes. you need to read this. And my guess is they're all the people who are in the private parties yep. sharing notes. All right. And last but not least, a skiff is a sensitive compartmented information facility. Perhaps. I wouldn't have got that. So, okay. I would have okay. gotten I, like one letter. I knew what it was, but I didn't. Yeah. yeah. The initials stood for <laughs>